So in the previous lecture, we talked about the block diagram reduction technique and uh, followed by the uh, procedure to obtain block diagrams of electrical and mechanical systems. So this was the problem that we did last. And today we'll discuss about the signal flow graph, which is an alternative to block diagram representation. And in fact, it's uh, simpler than, uh, first of all, it's uh, in terms of representation, simpler than block diagram reduction, as well as if you want to find the transfer function, it uh, allows you to have transfer function, to obtain the transfer function in a very simpler manner using a formula called as Mason's gain formula. So this was something that I discussed in, in the introduction, introductory part of uh, unit two, where I showed you the content of your syllabus. So today we'll discuss about uh, signal flow graph, what exactly is it, and how do we obtain signal flow graph from log diagrams. And then we'll talk about the Mason's gain formula uh, to obtain the transfer function from given signal flow graph. So why do we need to study signal flow graph? So first thing is that because uh, things that you kept on studying in unit one, you obtain transfer function of schematics of mechanical and electrical systems in unit one using the mathematical expression obtained from the uh, equations that governs the dynamics of the system. So there you learn to obtain transfer function. Then again, in unit two, you talked about a pictorial representation of system called this block diagram from there. You learn how to obtain transfer function. So th this becomes a, uh, a second alternate or a second way to obtain transfer function using block diagram. Third alternate to obtain transfer function is signal flow graph. So again, this is a, a sort of representation of the system and is one of the most preferable uh, method today because all other methods representing system, control system schematically or by a block diagram is uh, difficult compared to this one. So this is an easy representation of systems. And the drawbacks that are associated with the block diagram reduction techniques are, uh, first of all, it is tedious and time consuming. So those of you who uh, try to do the questions using block diagram reduction technique would have find it to be uh, quite time consuming. And it, it was difficult to choose the rules that uh, were supposed to be applied. So out of the six or seven rules which we learned during block diagram reduction technique, we didn't have any uh, specific procedure or any uh, clue of how we are going to apply the rules to obtain uh, or to reduce the blocks. So it, it was all our perception that how are we going to perceive the block diagram and some of you opt for different rules, some of some of opt for different. So it will be difficult. It was difficult to choose the rules in block diagram reduction. So the third drawback was that no standard procedure was there to follow. So uh, it, 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 you didn't knew which rule was to be applied correctly. Uh, so it, uh, before you so before you saw you you, you obtain the transfer function, you have to look at the problem very carefully to find which rule had to be applied. So there are no standard procedure that were to be followed to apply the rules and to obtain the transfer function. So to avoid these problems, block diagram is first converted into signal flow graph and a formula known as Mason's gain formula is applied to find the transfer function. So first of all, we'll define few terms that are associated with signal flow graph. So shown over here is a typical signal flow graph. So this is how signal flow graph looks like. And it will be having these points which are termed as nodes. Then you have branches the arrows shown, uh, the lines with arrows show the branches. And how do we obtain SFGs or signal flow graph from block diagram will also be studied today. So the first definition is for node. So node represents a system variable which is equal to the sum of all incoming signals. All, all outgoing signals from the node are equal to the node variable and do not affect the value of the node variable. So the elements small elements show, shown in circular circles are node and the definition says that they represent a system variable. So the, these may be representing a system variable. So which means that we can assign them a name 
for example let's say i call it as n1 i am taking abbreviative n just to uh, make it remember that these are nodes so they, these are variables n1 n2 n3 n4 n5 and n6 n7 so there are seven nodes in this particular sfg and each of these nodes represents some sort of variable so which may be voltage so you can talk about uh, voltages at particular nodes so n1 will become in, in place of n you will be writing v or it, it, if it is representing a mechanical system then you can write in place of n as f so it may have force or it may be having torque it may be representing a variable a torque or force that depends upon what system it represents so in general we'll write it, it as n1 so n could be voltage force or torque or anything else or any other variable that you will be having in your uh, system so it represents system variable which is equal to the sum of all incoming signals now if you talk about uh, nodes apart from n1 so other than n1 all other nodes will be having incoming signal for example if you talk about the node n2 so n2 this particular node has a signal coming from here another signal that comes from this side so there are two signals that are coming to end so the variable will be equal to the sum of the all the incoming signals so n2 will be equal to the signal that is coming from this branch this uh, this branch and uh, this branch so the sum of two branches will give you provide you the uh, value of variable n2 all outgoing signals from the node are equal to node variable and do not affect and any value that goes from n2 for example in this direction so this value which goes towards m3 will not affect the value of variable n2 so of course this is uh, something that we talk in case of ideal systems so we are assuming right now that these are some ideal systems and in ideal systems we say that the values that are picked from the node in the form of voltage force or torque so these values which are picked will not affect to uh, the variable which is acting as a source then we talk about branch a branch is a signal travels a, a signal travels along a branch from one node to another in the direction indicated by the branch arrow and in the process gets multiplied by the gain or transmittance of the branch so you would be having signals traveling in the direction of branch arrows which means that if you talk about node 1 the signal will always travel towards right from node 1 to node 2 so it's not possible for the signal to travel otherwise so this is wrong if you're going to have signal flowing from node 2 towards node 1 it's not going to happen because you represented an arrow you assign uh, this line an arrow so this this is nothing but a branch so the branch arrow represents the direction of signal flow and the signal will never flow against the direction of branch arrows and of course when the signal is coming from a variable let's say this was voltage v naught or v dash or v1 let's say this is this is voltage v1 so v2 is nothing but is equal to voltage v1 multiplied by gain or transmittance g1 so g1 in case of sfg is most of, more often refer, referred as transmittance while in block time diagram we call it as gain in case of sfg we to call it as transmittance so it's defined as transmittance in sfg and gain in block block representation so v2 in this case will become v1 multiplied by g1 so that's not all you have one more signal coming from this branch from node n3 so if we say that this is voltage v3 then this can further be written as plus v3 multiplied by h1 so this is the value of voltage or the variable at node 2 so this is what it means in the direction indicated by the branch arrow and in the process gets multiplied by the transmittance of the branch and then we define input node or source it is a node with only outgoing branches so any node in this sfg that you recognize as the one which has only outgoing branches node 1 so this is the input node or source 
then you have output node or sync so as the name suggests it, it is it is a node which will be having only incoming branches that is this node so this is the only node in this particular sfg that has incoming branch then you define the term path so it is the traversal of connected branches in the direction of the branch arrows so there are uh, three things traversal of connected branches direct in the direction of branch arrows such that no node is traversed more than once so if these three things are going to be satisfied then you are going to call that thing as path so first thing is that you will have to uh, uh, traverse uh, along the connected branches the second is in the direction of branch arrow which means you you are not going to move opposite to the direction of branch arrow and the third is that no node should be traversed more than once so what does this mean so if you look at this sfg we are going to traverse along the branch arrows so these are the branches and the direction of uh, traversal will be along the arrows so we are not going to traverse opposite to the direction of arrows so in that case it will not qualify as the definition path so for a path to or for a line let's say a line to qualify as path it should have its traversal along the branch arrows in such a manner that no node is traversed twice for example if you look at this figure if i start from node 1 then move to node 2 then to node 3 4 5 6 7 so this qualifies as a path because i am moving along the branch in the direction of branch arrows and I only traverse all the node once. So no node is being traversed twice. And if I say I started from node 1, let's say I start from N1, then I move to N2 in this direction. Then I further move, I, uh, if I say I move in this direction. So it's not possible because I'm going to move opposite to the direction of branch arrow. So this will not qualify as a path. So it's wrong to move against the direction of branch arrows. And let's say if I move in the direction of branch arrows in this direction and then I went to node 4 or let's say node 5. So this is node 5. I start from node 1 traverse through node 2, 3, 4 and I reach node 5. After node 5, I observed that there was a branch arrow in this direction. So I moved in this direction. Now after this, I reach node, th node 4 again. And then I, after reaching node 4, went forward in this direction. So this Traversal does not qualify as a path because you are traversing node 4 twice. So the condition for traversal to be called as path is that no node should be traversed more than once. And since you are traversing this node 4 more than once when you start from this path, you start from N1, N2, N3, N4, N5, back to N4, then forward. So you are going to traverse node 4 as well as node 5 two times and thus this traversal will not qualify as a path. Then we define forward path. So forward path is a path. So first of all it should qualify as a path, the forward path and then it will have a specific qualification apart from being a path. So it is a path from the input node to the output which means that you will start from the input node and you will have to reach somehow the output node such that all the uh, uh, the definitions for path are being qualified uh, are being satisfied so you start from this node move in the direction of branch arrows such that no node is tra traversed twice and reach the output node so this becomes the forward path so in this particular figure you have how many forward paths so from one to 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You start from 1, reach node 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this becomes a forward path. So this is one forward path. Because this traversal qualifies as a path and is starting from input node, reaching the output node. Now the other possible way is that you start from the input node, 
reach node 5 then go instead of going through g5 you go through g6 to node 6 and then to 7 this also qualifies as a forward path because the traversal qualifies as a path and you are starting from node the starting node or the input node and reaching the output node and one more thing i think i missed it now uh, output node is also called a sync so this is source this is sync anyone else observing any other forward path so you can answer if you see any other forward path So I don't see any other forward path in this particular figure. There are only two forward paths starting from input, reaching output. Now if you talk about loop. So loop is a path which originates and terminates at the same node. So again, loop should qualify as a path, first of all. And the second qualification is that it should originate and terminate at the same node. So any node from where you start, you should traverse in such a way that you get a path and you finish to the same node where you started. For example, let's talk about this node 2. So you start from node 2, traverse along this branch arrow G2 to node 3, then back from node 3 to node 2 through H1. So this particular traversal qualifies as a path because no node is being traversed twice and uh, all the things that are that, that specifies the path are being uh, uh, met and you are reaching the same node where you started and thus this becomes a loop again if you look at this particular traversal starting from node 4 to 5 then back to 4 this is also a loop because you're travel you're traversing along the branch arrows if you look at node 5 to node 6 so if I traverse in this direction starting from 5 to 6 then back to 5 in this manner so does it qualify as loop or not please answer anyone is it a loop or not okay no So it's not a loop because uh, you see that G6 has branch arrow in this direction, clockwise. While if you traverse anti-clockwise, so you're moving against the direction of branch arrows and thus this will not qualify as a loop since it doesn't qualify as a path. So it's necessary for a loop to first qualify as a path. Then it should originate and terminate at the same time. Likewise, forward path should qualify first of all as a path, then it should have either qualification as a starting node to be input and the ending node to be output node. Likewise, you have non-touching loops. So loops are said to be non-touching if they do not possess any common node. So it means that for non-touching loops, loops can be easily identified if you identify the number of loops that the SFG possesses. So for, for obtaining the number of non-touching loops or identifying the non-touching loops, you will first have to find out how many individual loops does the SFG have. So after uh, uh, investigating the number of loops that the SFG have, then you will have to conclude that out of these loops, for example, in this particular SFG, I identified one, two. So if you look, there are three loops, uh, four loops. So in this particular SFG, there are four loops. One is, so let me uh, mark these loops. One loop is this. The other loop is from G4, H2. This is second loop. Then you have G4, G5, H3. This is third loop. And then you have a fourth loop. G4, G6, H3. 
So there are in total four loops and this particular SFG. Please stop me if you think that I am wrong at some place and you see any other loop or any other forward path or anything else that I miss. So you can stop me there. And uh, what I see here is only four forward four loops. And now out of these four loops, then we will have to identify those loops which are not uh, touching. Touching means that they will not be having any node in common. So if you look at loop one, this is loop one. Let's call this as loop one. Let's call this as loop two. And this as loop three. Well, this one as loop four. So out of these four loops, L1 and L2 seems to be non-touching because they don't have any node in common. Again, L1 and L3 are non-touching because no node is common. Again, L1 and L4 are non-touching. But L2 and L3 are touching loops because they have this node as well as this node in common. And moreover has one branch in common. Likewise, L2 and L4 are also touching and L3 and L4 are also touching. So L, there is only three pairs of loop which pairs with loop one as non-touching loops. Now we define forward path gain. So this is nothing but the gain or the transmittance of the forward path being multiplied together. So first of all, you will have to identify for this the forward path. So it is the product of the branch gain encountered or branch transmittances encountered in traversing a forward path. For example, I ident identified two forward paths. So first forward path will, will be having its gain or forward path gain as G1 into G2 into G3 into G4 into G5 into G6. So the product of all the G7, sorry, this is G7. The product of all these transmittances will give you the forward path gain of first forward path. When I identified the second forward path and the forward path gain of that second forward path will be G1 into G2 into G3 into G4 into G6 into G7. So this will be the forward path gain of second forward path. Then you define you can have loop gain where you talk about the product of transmittances of the loops and there are, you, you may find because this these definitions are taken from uh, and Gopal. So if you pick other books, you might find some more definitions. So, but thing is that you understand from the terms which are being introduced. So if you see any other definition, I guess you 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 are supposed to understand it. What does that term mean? Stands for, for example, if somebody says loop gain, so loop loop gain stands stands for the uh, gain of a particular loop. For example, the uh, loop gain of L1 will be G2 multiplied by H1. So you will be having terms like this and I guess if you are clear with with the uh, terms associated, the basic terms associated with SFG, you can uh, figure out what those new terms mean. Now, the question is how do you obtain signal program from block diagram? So for this, what we do is we first identify summing points, takeoff points, and the gains of the block diagrams. And all the summing points and takeoff points in the block diagram will be represented in the form of nodes in SFG. So for any summing point or takeoff point that you encounter in block diagram will be represented by nodes. You will be drawing nodes in place of summing point and takeoff point in block diagram for SFG. So the second thing is that all the gain blocks that you saw in block diagram will be replaced by transmittances in SFG. So this is what we saw here. So G1 case of block was uh, block diagram was a block. G2 was also a block. H1 was a block. So in SFG, what we are doing is we are replacing those blocks by branch arrows and assigning them the same terms which were uh, specified in the blocks. So if G1 was specified in block diagram representation in, inside the block will now be represented simply by G1 in SFG over the branch arrow. 
Now there is a note that in case if takeoff point appears after a summing point, what does this mean? So if suppose that you have a summing point in block diagram representation, let's say this is summing point, you have one input given in this side, the second input here, it may be minus or plus, whatever, or you may be having other inputs as well. And let's say the takeoff point appears after the summing point. So you have this is the takeoff point. So in case if takeoff point appears after a summing point, then both points are taken as one node in SFG. So this particular thing in case of SFG will be represented by a common node. So you will be representing this comparator and this takeoff point by one node, sim simply one node. Like this. However, if the takeoff point precedes the summing point, then they are taken at different nodes. But if you encounter a case, let's say something like this, where you have takeoff points preceding the summing point. In that case, you are not going to take them as common node. So you will, ha you will have to represent the takeoff point by a separate node and the summing point by a different node. Now my question is why? Why do you do so? Why are you representing uh, the node which follows the summing point, both of them with a common node, while if it proceeds in summing point, they are represented by a different node. So why do we, we do, do so? Okay, one bonus mark. I repeat the question. Why are you representing the summing point and the takeoff point by a common node if the takeoff point follows the summing point it, or, or it appears after the summing point. And why are you taking separate nodes for takeoff point and summing point if takeoff point appears before the summing point? All right, the reason is that uh, if you are going to, uh, in this particular case, if you have signal X at this particular point, and let's say this was y. So at this point, you had a signal x minus y, while at this particular point, you had signal x only. If you look at this particular case, so in this case, you have x here, so this signal will also be x. But if you are going to take this takeoff point, or you're going to make this takeoff point appear at this location, so the signal at this place will not be x, rather x and this signal which is nothing but y with the minus sign so this will be x minus y so if you are going to represent these two components or these two elements by a common node in that case you are going to wrongly represent the takeoff point and you will be having a variable x minus y instead of x but if you do analysis of at this particular case you find that and uh, the variable remains the same. Now there are, here are four, uh, more examples of uh, how we represent SFGs. So if a common block is given, uh, G a block is given which has a gain of G, then this will be represented by a straight line, a branch with an arrow showing the direction of signal flow with transport in G. Likewise, if suppose that you have uh, input U given to two blocks G1 and G2 which are further fed to a uh, com uh, summer or comparator and the output is Y. This can be represented in the form of SFG as this. So U is the input then you have G1 transmitters of this particular branch arrow and for this you have transmitters G2 and Y is nothing but the sum of G1 and G2. Likewise if you have this particular case where you have feedback HS, then this will be represented by, so R is fed to the comparator and has no block in between this, this will be represented by a gain 1, and then you have G1, so this is G1, and then you have H. Uh, one more thing that, because you have a negative sign 
at the comparator with, associated with this block H. And in SFG, we, we normally do not assign plus or minus at nodes. So whatever minus sign that appears at the set comparator side will be assigned to the gain in SFG. So that is why instead of assigning a minus sign at this particular node, we are going to write that minus or associate that minus with H, the feedback gain. So this is how we represent the negative feedbacks in case of SFGs. Again, more cases. If suppose that you are given a block. So you, you, you will always have to apply these rules. So you will have to replace the summing and takeoff point by nodes and gain by transmittances. Keeping this note in mind. So if you look at this uh, particular case, you have gain. Let's say this is per, uh, this is uh, node. We we have this particular thing by node. And then you have a gain, gain block in the direction of signal is towards right. So we have branch arrows showing signal should be flowing towards right. Then you have summer. So you have signal. This uh, comparator will be represented by a node. This is the node corresponding to the comparator and from this comparator you have another transmittance G2 going outward but, but one more transmittance coming inward. So this G3 has branch direction, branch arrows direction uh, and to this. And since it is having a plus sign and that is why G3 is pos taken positive and not negative. Likewise you have node corresponding to this takeoff point. This is the node. And from this particular node, you have a signal going to block G4 and then back to G1. And this is how the signal is being shown in SFG in direction given by branch arrow. Likewise, this comparator will be represented by this particular node. Then you have this comparator by. So this node corresponds to 1. So 1 is assigned here. Then you have second comparator given by this node. The third takeoff point is given by this node. So after drawing all the nodes, you will be assigning transmittance in the direction of signal flow. So from left to right is G1. So this is the transmittance assigned. G3 again assigned. G2 is assigned and G4. Likewise, in this case, uh, there's only uh, one specific thing that I uh, should uh, make you understand is you will see that here is a loop we call it as self loop so this particular loop is called as self loop and if you look at the block representation so you can write the self loop because this was not discussed in the definitions so such type of loops are termed as self loop if you see here you have a takeoff point which appears after the comparator and if you remember the note, it says that if the takeoff point appears after the comparator, in, this, in that case, you are going to take them with a common node. So they will be represented by a common node shown over here. And the takeoff point or the signal that is being picked in this direction, so this, this is shown by this arrow, which goes to G2, then back to the same comparator. So it will be shown in this manner in case of SFG. So the signal is being picked multiplied by transmittance G2 and then fed back to the same node. This is what this, this particular part means. And the rest of uh, the block you can understand yourself. Now again one more example if suppose that you are given by a given this block diagram and I like try to explain this step by step. and. We will first assign the nodes to each comparator takeoff point and we see here that we have uh, takeoff point following the comparator while here we see that takeoff point precedes the comparator. So you will be having one node for this, one node for this, two nodes for this. So one node for this, one node for this. So four node and finally fifth node. Then you can assign nodes at the output and input as well. So these can be also given and drawn as nodes. So here I draw nodes corresponding to each of the components. So comparator has this particular node. This comparator along with the takeoff point is represented by this node. This takeoff point represents this node and this comparator is shown by this particular node. And this takeoff point is represented by this node. 
Secondly, we will assign transmittance to each of these. So, the, uh, the first we will assign the branch arrows. So, these shows the direction of flow of signal as shown in the block diagram. Then the transmittance. So, G1, G2 and G3. Then we have the other arrows or the signal flows. And the first is this particular signal which doesn't have any block which means that the transmittance of this block will be taken as one. Then other paths as well. So, from this particular node, we have H2 fed back to comparator and from the same node, we have H1 fed back to this comparator. So, this is represented by these branches. So, uh, and since you have a minus sign here and that is why you will be assigning a negative to the transmittance of SFG. And likewise, you have this loop, this uh, path, uh, which is represented by this path in SFG then the input and output. So I guess this makes clear how to obtain block diagram, uh, how to obtain SFG from given block diagram. And if you have any questions, you can ask me. And one more thing, if, if suppose that you're given a system, a, a set of equations that represents the system. So let's say we have these equations which represent some sort of uh, system. And you are required to obtain SFG using these equations. So first of all, you'll have to identify the variables that are present in the system. So I see five variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. I don't see x6. So which means that there are five variables in this particular system. So I will be drawing at least five nodes like this. So x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And it all depends upon you. You can take x1 on rightmost side, x5 on leftmost side. But because we uh, learned that we, we saw that in most cases the signal flow from left towards right. So, but it's, it's a nomenclature and it's not necessary that you always adhere to something that uh, is. But it makes things easy. So if you adhere to nomenclature, then things will be easy to understand. So we assume again that the signals are flowing from left towards right. So nodes are taken accordingly. So signal will be flowing from x1 towards x2, finally towards x5. So if you look at the first expression, which says that x2 is nothing but a12 x1 plus a22 x2 plus a32 x3. So this means that x2 is having a signal picked from the node x1 from node x2 or, and from variable x3, each of them having separate transmittance. So x1 will be multiplied by a transmitter a12. Then x2, the same variable with a self loop, will be having a transmittance a22. And the third x3, so x2 is having one more signal coming from x3 as a which is multiplied by a32. Now instead of drawing a straight line, we will represent this by a curve having a reverse branch arrow having transmittance a32. So again, you may argue that why aren't we not drawing in this manner a straight line. And I told you that the signal will be flowing from left towards right and we prefer the straight line. We leave this straight path for signals that will be flowing forward towards right. So that is why we didn't pick this particular straight line and start draw do this uh, curve for showing reverse flow of signal. So if you further simplify it, you will have the SFG looking in this manner. Y forward A32. Nonetheless, it's here. So you have for X2 transmittance A12, A22 is the self loop, A32 is the signal that comes from X3. Then if you look at the second equation, A3 is A23 times X2. So X3 is A23 times X2 plus A43 times X4. So X4 is here and uh, A43. So this is A43. So X3 is A23 times X2 and A43 times X4. Likewise, X4 is A24 times X2. So you see this path here. So this is a signal being picked from X2 fed to X4. Then another signal is picked from X3 multiplied by A34. So this is the signal picked from X3. Then another signal picked from the same variable X4, which is nothing but a self loop. So A44. 
then x5 is nothing but a25 so you will be picking a signal from x2 multiplied by a25 plus another signal being picked from variable x4 multiplied by a45 this provides the variable x5 so this is the required sfg from the given set of equations and thus you this represents the system which uh, was given by these set of equations now another way of representing a signal is uh, again suppose that you have another set of equations which has differentials so now we have terms which are derivatives so you see that x1 dot is equal to 2x1 minus 5x2 plus 3x3 plus 2r r is input and y is output and either you have x2 dot then x3 dot so you will study these are called as state uh, representation in this unit or these are nothing but the state variables so we'll discuss about this in detail so suppose that you're given a set of equations represented by this and you are required to find the sfgs so in in such type of problems what you do is you first assign nodes to the derivatives and then from for example if suppose that i assign a node to x3 dot so this is nothing but d by dt of x3 then i will be assigning another node to x3 and these two nodes will be connected by a term 1 by s so what is so special about 1 by s so 1 by s is nothing but this is a function that represents in time domain uh, integration so if you are going to integrate x3 dot you get x3 in time domain so since the signal flow graph are something that we talk in laplace domain and thus instead of writing this by integrations because integrations have something to do with time domain we are mathematically going to represent this by 1 upon s and thus these two nodes would be connected in this manner likewise you will be drawing another node x2 dot and x2 this will be connected by 1 by s and x1 dot and x1 this will again be connected by 1 by s after drawing these nodes then we will be assigning nodes r and y so we have all our variables shown in this set of equations represented and then we see that x1 uh, dot x1 dot is equal to 2x1 minus 5x2 plus 3x3 plus 2r so you pick x1 dot x1 dot is here so x1 dot has minus 5x2 so it's already shown then you have 2x1 so you should be having a signal being picked from x1 back to x1 dot having transmittance 2 and from x3 3x3 so 3 will be picked from variable x3 fed to x1 dot then another variable picked from r multiplied by transmit transmittance 2 so 2 will be picked from the signal and fed here so i guess i don't know they have first uh, solved x1 dot so yes so x1 dot is being uh, drawn using the first equation using the second equation you can draw x2 dot in this manner so this is x2 dot then you can show the uh, variable you can draw x3 dot so you have x3 dot so i am leaving this on all uh, all upon you to understand yourself i will explain you basics and i guess you can uh, simply by looking or you can draw these yourself and compare with the answer that is given here and finally we have output y which is given by this expression and thus this can be drawn in this way so this is the final uh, signal flow graph of these set of equations and thus i guess you can now draw sfgs from the set of equations as well as plot diagram yourself and if you have any question you can ask me because i am going to move towards our next lecture which is mason's gain formula so before that you can put questions or doubts that you have